Welcome to a new episode of Big Bun Game Club. I'm going to talk about No More Heroes. This game just dropped so suddenly. I was on Twitter scrolling around and then Cheap Ass Gamer comes by and says, Hey guys, No More Heroes 1 and 2 are on the Switch right now. So I immediately bought those games. I was dying to revisit No More Heroes 1 for so long and I was stuck with just playing the shitty PS3 version. Uh... So going back and playing the definitive version of it on the Switch was just really nice. Uh, and playing it, I got a whole new appreciation for it. Because when I first played No More Heroes, I was like 16 uh, at that time. And, you know, I remember seeing trailers for No More Heroes thinking, wow, this game's kind of cool, I, you know, whatever. And when I saw the game case in the, uh, in the store... And at this time, it was also my birthday, so I was just kind of looking for some stuff to get for my birthday at that time. So I was like, oh, you know, I remember No More Heroes. I remember seeing a trailer for it, and it looked really cool. The cut, the cover looked nice, and I loved cell shading. I still do. I think cell shading is really one of my favorite ways you could make a game. I just love that visual style, so I was really sold on it as it is. So I got that for, for my birthday. And I took it home and I played it and I loved just how how zany and goofy a lot of stuff was. I love the situations the game puts you in. The combat is just is just meaningless fun. Like a lot of games try to give you all these combos and levels and all this stuff that kind of like adds these nuances to the combat. But No More Heroes is just like Nah, here, press A, and then, and then waggle the, the Wemo when the time's right. And it's just like, this is so, like, cathartic. It's such a, a, a satisfying combat system that's so simple. Like, a lot of like, you know, you have the Samurai Jack game that released earlier that was a very basic game. It's very simple and straightforward, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just a very, like, straightforward game. Uh... And it's just viewed as just a hey, this is a PS2 game on on PS PS4 and um, Xbox One, etc. But No More Heroes really makes a simplistic combat style seem very very well like structured because the game just kind of takes advantage of it. It throws so many enemies at you, and it really utilizes that simplistic combat to be like hey, let's go crazy and and have fun. And the visual style of it, it just Comp you know, just adds to it. Each swipe, each swing, each attack, you get this water fountain of of blood gushing out. And I really love that drawing style. It really uh, reminded me at, of Tarantino a lot with his, how he handles his gore and all that kind of stuff. I, I just loved how striking it is uh, visually. And the story just kind of added to it. Like, at the time when I was playing it, I just loved how you play it with with one expectation of, oh, this will just be a game of you being number one, and then when you're number one, that's kind of where it ends. You kind of got that with Mad World, so I was kind of expecting the same thing with this game. I was like, oh man, it's going to be just climbing up the ranks. And then when you get to the top, it, the game just turns it around, and it's like, no, this is actually what's really going on. And I really loved how how sudden that change was and how it kind of just drops it on you. I really, really did enjoy that a lot with uh, Nomi Heroes when I first played it. Now revisiting it, uh, you know, I have a whole new appreciation for it. So I've also played the PS3 version, so I'll talk about this right now. Uh, I, I think... You know, at the time when the PS3 version came out, it was like around that time where, you know, people were kind of moving away from the Wii and all this kind of stuff. So you really only, the only option you had was the PS3 version for some people, unless you bought the Wii U or you had your Wii still laying around, whatever. You know, the PS3 version was probably the most accessible one to get for a while. Uh, but what kind of shoots the PS3 version in the foot is... The presentation is just bad. Like, there's a video that puts all three versions side by side. The PS3, the the Wii, and the Switch version side by side. And I was surprised that the PS3 version kind of chugs along with the, that. It, it maintains, like, 
nearly the same frames as the Wii version, but it dips a lot more. Like, it kind of goes between 20 to 30, sometimes a little bit lower than 20, according to this video. Uh, this video also showed the Switch version kind of going between, like, 30 to 60. Like, 60... It maintains 60 for the most part during uh, gameplay, but the 30 would mostly happen during, like, uh, a new stage opening area kind of stuff. So, surprisingly, the Switch version, I, I feel, is visually stronger it has a stable frame rate and they cleaned it up a lot like the switch the wii version had a lot of jaggies to it but i mean the cell shading that the game had hit it very well but the if you look at it compared to the switch version it is very clean and it's very smooth it's very um nice to look at and this is kind of what it should have been the the ps3 version i feel like that they kind of just remade the models and the environments look nice, but I think the character model is kind of pale in comparison to what the original game was going for. There's a scene where uh, you have Travis and Death Metal going up these stairs, and the shadows are so sharp that you know, half of, of Travis's face is covered in darkness, and that looked really stylistic. It looked really cool. But then you see the PS3 version, and it kind of removes that... Um, contrast from it and it kind of brightens the models a little bit up which I don't really like you know a lot of the shading that they did in the original No More Heroes and that they maintained in the Switch version really made the game you know stand out the PS3 version just kind of looks it kind of makes it look a little too safe and it's very easy to fall in the trap of oh my of being amazed by how how detailed it looks but a lot of this is just surface level shit like i feel like once you get past it you start to see a lot of of how ugly it really is um you know a lot of the character models just look off to me like travis just looks really weird in this uh his coat looks nice but it's just it, it doesn't have that same uh feel that the original had when i played it for the first time so I really did not really love the, the PS3 port. I kind of tolerated it for what it was. But, uh, you know, to compare to the Switch version, that Shinobu fight was awful on the PS3. Like, I remember, I remember that fight when I first played it, and I was r ready to just stop playing. It, I, there was terrible, like, horrendous collision detection in, in the PS3 version. Uh, nothing really worked the way it should. It, it just was just janky and awful. It just felt like that it was incomplete. Like, it just really didn't feel playable. Um, you know, it just feels like only barely passable. I don't know. It just... It, it, that, that fight just had a lot of issues that I did not like at all. While the Switch version was very smooth and easy to navigate. Like, the only challenge that you had with the Shinobu boss fight was the insta-kill move she has. But the insta-kill move that she has in the PS3 version is very easy to fall victim to because you're not only fighting uh, her, you're fighting the bad collision detection with the bad camera at the same time. It was horrendous. Every time you'd be near those columns in the school, you would just be kind of stuck there. And you would have to like kind of you know, plan ahead of time of where she's where she is in relation to you and all that kind of stuff because if you don't have any idea how far she is from you or where she is and you get stuck on that column that could change the whole flow of the combat so a lot of this game has very bad hit detection in the ps3 version so i really do feel sorry for people who only played that version it is a terrible version and the blood effects are god awful they are a bloody mist you know, you have in this, the Wii and the Switch version, you have this gory explosion of blood that's very stylistic and poppy and cool. And the PS3 version is like... And that's it. It's, a, it's just very disappointing and not, and not fulfilling. And it also just lacks a lot of the, of the feedback that the game had in the Wii and the Switch version. Like, the Switch version had very good feedback to every strike I hit. Uh... You know, the PS3 version, I think, did a good job kind of instituting a normal controller setting. But I think the Switch version is the version to go. You know, if you hear anyone praise the PS3 version, they don't listen to them. Uh, because they also isolated a lot of the map. They shrunk the map as well. 
while in the Switch and Wii version, they have expanded the map. They have a normal map. Uh, so I, I really think the Switch version is the definitive version. It has everything that was in the Wii version from what I remember. And it has better presentation. It's just an overall better game. It runs even better. Uh, it's insane. Like, the other thing I was concerned with was Normal Heroes 2, when it came out on the Wii, was the only one that had a normal standard controller support. So when they announced this port, I was like, this is going to have to be played with the Joy-Cons. There's no way that you would need you, you could use a Pro Controller. They they added in the first like I, I I was expecting the second game to support the pro controller and all that because you know that's when that's when they introduced it. They even threw that in into the first game. The first game had all this attention put into it, so it really does feel like the Switch version is really the the definitive experience for that for that game. Uh, unless they took out some cuts that I didn't know because one of the things that I didn't do when I first played. Uh, no one hears on the Wii was I never did a lot of the side mission stuff. I've only done the jobs and I only did one job. I think I did the gas pump and uh, I did one of the assassination missions back to back to to grind for money. I never did anything else. Uh, and I didn't do the um, the lottery, the uh, bingo balls or whatever, like those little balls you find scattered. I didn't do those. I did some. T I did some of the gym to be honest. Uh, but I did get all the katanas at in my first run, but when I played the Switch version, I wanted to go back to, I wanted to do everything. I wanted to do as much as I could. I wanted to do, do the stuff that I missed out on, and a lot of that stuff I missed out on, I really can't believe I, I skipped it, because there was a lot of cool jobs that I really loved more than the uh, gas pump. I love the cat mission. It, it doesn't pay well, but it's kind of fun to just to get these cats, to collect these cats, and each cat you pick up, you just hear Travis doing meow. So I really liked uh, a lot of that, a lot of that job stuff to do. And I also liked doing the uh, finding the hidden balls, which I was surprisingly easy to figure out. And I also did not know that you can kick dumpsters open to get money and to get some T-shirts. You can also um, uh, go through the ground and poke the ground to get money. I never knew that in the in the Wii version, so I was learning uh, learning all the stuff that I missed out on when I first played it, and it was just a lot more fun that way. I found myself really enjoying driving around Santa Destroy way more than the first time. Uh, I really got to hand it to Suda Fifty One. Like this game had a lot of a lot of love put into it that I didn't really appreciate. Like I didn't appreciate the design of grinding money to get to the next ranked mission. I didn't appreciate that the first time. And now, going over it this time, I started to, to appreciate really the flow of that. Uh, you know, I, I think that maybe they could have done a little better better job, but I feel like with No Me Heroes 1, I found myself having less of an issue grinding for cash uh, for the most part. Like, you, you can get, like, 50,000 LBs uh, per mission if you really find the right mission. Like, you can do the gas pump and get 50,000 each, each time you do it, uh, which is really, which is really good. Uh, so I really loved more and more the pace of No More Heroes this time around. I really loved that it, they broke up the monotony with these, en with these endless grind jobs that you have to do, and it kind of, it kind of helps the game pull you back down to reality, like it grounds the game. Uh, each time like you go into a boss fight and you think this is a little too nefarious or too like out there And then when you're, when you're done, it's like all right now you got pump gas mow the lawn and I really loved all of that, you know uh, all of this helped communicate a lot of What it's like to, to be in that world and to be uh, Travis and then going each level and you're just like, each level is like a reward. It's like you've done all this grindy shit. Here's here's a hack and slash story mission for you. It, and it really makes you really savor the story stuff that goes on. And I really, really loved it. I think No More Heroes 1 really does a very solid job 
uh, getting you in the mindset of the characters in the in the world and the stuff that's going on that is very easy to miss and and look over. Uh, so I really like that as well. So now let's and the music. I should before we get into the story, the music is phenomenal. I loved it each time that they reuse the the main theme with different little, little twists. It's like Tartarus almost in Persona Three. Uh, I just love the new ways that they remixed it each level. It was really solid. It was really cool. I just loved it. I I can gush about that music all day. The boss themes are really good. Like, everything just has this big, like, synergy going on with it. So now, let's move on to the story. The story is really... You know, when I first played it, I loved the story, as I said. Uh, it was very different and unique i i love and i think at the at the time when i played it i could not really pinpoint what drew me in like i love the fourth wall breaking stuff sure i like travis he uses this this asshole kind of guy that that just dumb shit was going on and he was in these goofy situations etc like he was kind of calling some of the shit out as well etc but there was just something going on that I could not really uh, comprehend or, or or find until now when I was replaying it this time around that I really that it feels like a character study almost like it feels like it's studying uh, all of these these ways that people can can be turned to a a psychopath or a a killer or an assassin, like kind of the toll it has on people. And as Travis is starts off, he starts off as this arrogant asshole guy that doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. And you know, he, he has a very big head and very big opinion of himself. He gets involved in the first ranked mission against death metal. You know, and it starts off like bombastic. It starts off with him kicking the door down, killing, slicing the guy in half, and just being like "fuckhead" and being really angry. And then you, you see him talking to the to the uh, to Death Metal, and he's just like, "Oh, what do you call this? Like, look at this place. This place is nice." And he's like, "Oh, this is a place to die." And and Death Metal's just telling him straightforward, like, "You're gonna, you might regret this." What you, what's going to happen after this, you could, you know, the bodies that you're going to be building and are going to be growing. It's never going to stop. The killing won't end. Turn back now. Stop. Like, he's telling him all this stuff to, like, this is your last chance to turn turn back and be a family man, pretty much. Like, he's telling him all this stuff, and Travis is not taking him seriously. Like, like he's respecting it enough to, like, hear him out, but he, he's just, he, he made up his mind. Like, he thinks this is what he wants. And... And you see, like, with Death Metal, he is this very, like, passive guy. He, he he accepted his fate. Like, he has done so much that he's accepted what's what's coming to him. And Travis doesn't really learn that yet. And then once he beat it, once he kills him, he realizes, after Silver Crystal tells him that you're going to be in this, this a ranked game now. Now you're going to be climbing up the ladder. People are going to be wanting to kill you. All this kind of stuff. And Travis tells him, tells him straight up that, uh, you know, this is fucked up, this is bullshit, you didn't tell me this, you lied to me, you set me up, all this stuff. And, you know, at the time, I want you, I want that to, this, to, I want this to, to, like, keep this in the back of your mind. He was not motivated to fight Death Metal to get with Sylvia Crystal at this time. Because if he was, he wouldn't be so mad that he, that she tricked him or anything. Like, they didn't have this agreement until that cutscene. So I want that to be in your little mo in, the, in the back of your mind for this whole video by the end. Because it's going to come back. So so death, so he, he gets kind of tricked into doing these ranked missions. And he does them. And... You know, Death Metal, it, he, he gives him a warning and he doesn't heed it and the, he kind of regrets it after that. But he, he accepts it because he wants to be with Sylvia Crystal, baby. You know, who wouldn't want to simp for her? So so they simp, so he simps for her by going off and doing the next ranked mission, which is for Dr. Peace. Dr. Peace is 
Was a boss fight that when I was a young kid, 16 years old, I hated this fight for a while. I kept falling, falling trick to his little gunplay, but once I found out the trick now, it's like, ah, oh, I can just out outrun him, etc. But anyways, uh, so Dr. Peace is a guy that that is at a baseball stadium, and this was really, I loved his his story and his character and everything about Dr. Peace. He's this guy that did all these shady shit, shit in the background. He wasn't an honest person. But he grew that he wants to earn the love of his family a little bit. But he knows that he can't, he can't go back. His daughter hates him. His wife hates him. Like, he has no family. And he's kind of accepting that. Like, he... he like, this... this each boss kind of represents a mindset with all his tolls, all these death tolls, all this stuff that that can come out of this kind of this kind of work. Uh, each one kind of represents that kind of stage. And Doctor Doctor Peace is this guy that's like he has he's at peace with what happened. He lost his family and he's at peace with that. He understands that his family won't accept him. You know, he has that line that the, la the, the last meal he had with his family tasted like blood. And he, he sensed that, it, that his family just grew to despise him. And so much so that once you beat him, uh, he just tells him, he's, he says that how he'll play a song that his daughter will love. Meaning that once she hears that he died, he, she'll be very happy to hear that. The other thing with Dr. Peace that I really liked was... You know, Travis just kind of calls him out and says that we love the violence and the blood, and he's and and Doctor Peace is savoring that. He's enjoying the killing, like he doesn't like he's at peace with that, and he likes who he is for that. Uh, and I really liked all that stuff that was going on with with that angle. And then once that fight's over, he's ready to move on. Travis is ready to go on to the next fight. The next fight being, oh, let's, oh man. The middle Dr. Peace. Why am I blanking on this one? Oh, Shinobu. I don't know why it took me a while to, to remember Shinobu. Whoops. Shinobu. Now, this one was a cool character. I do like that... I want to say this, this is out, out, you know, out there. I am impressed that they were able to get away with implying a massacre at a school. I just, I just want to just... Mention how how nuts that is. Imagine if they did that today. Like that, like you, you go to a school, you do all this stuff, and then you go. Then you, once they meet, make it to the boss. The cutscene is her sitting in the classroom, is like, oh, "I'll be with you in a minute." And you see all these students, like, like they're kind of backing away. They're kind of scared. And she like un like uh, opens her sword, and it's just like, dude, they showed this in a game, like. You know, it's just, it's wild to me that they that they were able to get away with that. Uh, so I just wanted to just put that out there. And Shinobu is kind of a mirror to Travis. Both of them are kind of obsessed with anime and all this kind of stuff. Uh, Shinobu mentions that she's trying to seek revenge for the guy who killed her father, uh, mistaking Travis for that or whatever. Like, it's never really clear if she blames Travis for it or if it's like, hey, I'm just doing this to get to, to that person. But I do like that it's this nice parallel where, uh, you know, for once, it, like, like this one kind of breaks a little bit of the mold where you have these two characters facing off and they both kind of come from the same place. And in that is probably, probably why he tried to spare, spared her at the end is because he sees a lot of himself in her. And it's also that cliche with a lot of anime tropes as well where the main character leaves the rival alive even though that the main character beat the rival he lets her get stronger to face to face him again or some form of understanding i do love that that everything about shinobu's story and the way the fight plays out and the way it ends all of it evokes from tropes from anime or or whatever. And I think that is just really neat. 
that they just threw it so obviously in there. Like they even like even Travis calls it out that he's telling her, telling Shinobu that she watches too much anime. Like there's nothing super deep about it, but it's so like you know uh, a synergy going on, and that happens with every fight. And even after that, you face after Shinobu. Uh, was it Destroy Man? I think Destroy Man's number six. No, no, no. Destroy Man is rank seven. Destroy Man. I, I have a bad memory with these ranks, which is sad, but it is what it is. But Destroy Man. I remember when I first played this game, I hated him. I was like, dude, this guy's an asshole. Fuck him. And when I played it, I also thought I could have sworn that they did a fake out death with him, like where he beat beat him the first time. Then like he he tricks Travis into giving him mercy. Somehow, and then a second phase of the fight starts. I thought that's what was going on, but it didn't happen. I was like, wow, I'm surprised. I thought there'd be a second phase of this fight. I'm really surprised that that played out this way. But uh, with him, I didn't remember a lot of the nuance that I loved about Destroy Man. Like, uh, you know, I talk about this this video, this uh, YouTuber called Genry, uh, G G H E N R Y. He does a lot of good videos. He did this one video series called Deadly Individualism. I highly recommend that video series. It's really good. Uh, he does a video on No More Heroes and he brings this up that every time the camera pans to Destroy Man when he's in the postal, when he's in the post office uh, costume, the camera shakes and you hear these loud noises in the background. But then when it goes to Travis, all that is gone. So it only goes back to, or only happens when the camera focuses on Destroy Man to really highlight that something inside him wants to come out. And I think it, it, it it's, and I think that's beautiful. Like just everything about him, like the way that he talks, the way that he dre he's dressed, that the fact that he's a post office worker and he starts off being like this very polite guy that's just dealing with people and he's just like, oh, you know. So many people give me such bullshit complaints. Can you imagine that? You know, uh, now now I know that we're ready for a fight. You know, it's very, you know, can, can you mind uh, turning the other way? It's kind of uh, gentlemanly to let me have some privacy. Yeah, you know, can you please like turn around? And he's being very polite to Travis. It's a, which is obvi obviously a facade, but he's doing all this stuff and it's like, it symbolizes a lot of how people are in, when they are at work, they kind of put this costume on. They pretend to be n this very, very nice person that's, that wouldn't yell at you or treat you like shit or anything. But then the second that th that, that costume goes off and he's himself, that you see who they really are. So you see Destroy Man as his polite postal worker, but the second that Travis turns his back on him, he is this... this dirty motherfucker and he's this guy that would take any cheap shot which uh Ganry also bring uh, brings up that's kind of a callback to the shinobu fight where shinobu is like saying oh what a gentleman you're not you didn't attack me while my back was turned you are fucking with me or whatever while destroy man took every cheap shot that he could to to win he never took a he never he was never fair with his competition so him you know as travis turns his back on him and uh, Destroy Man uh, taking that opportunity just shows how little of a gentleman he really is in reality. So it's a nice callback that Genry points out that I didn't even realize until he mentioned that. Uh, the other thing is that, that I really like about uh, Destroy Man's character is that uh, everything, uh, like, his is real self. That, when he is Destroy Man, not the postal worker... He is so tacky. He has this, and it it fits his his personality. And the other thing that I really liked was that you never get a clear shot of the guy's face. You see his eyes a little bit, but you never get a clear image of his face as much. You really have to kind of find that one frame where it shows it. But you know, it just kind of shows how how much he really wants to go a after people and all that kind of stuff. And see him. And you can see why he's an assassin in, in this kind of game is that he gets he takes out all the frustrations on the people who are trying to go after that rank 
Uh, the other thing I just really enjoy about Destroy Man's character is that it's another fight where it, it exemplifies the toll of this line of work. It shows that, you know, you might get someone that might, that, you know, they could be like Dr. Peace or Death Metal, or you get a guy like Destroy Man that, that truly gets excited over the fact that he gets to kill people and he, he finally gets to relieve all that stress of the world onto the, onto these un, suspecting people so i really liked that that destroy man had all this stuff going on and that's what normal heroes does a lot it, it does a lot of this this little like stuff that kind of feeds into it and this also kind of shows a little bit of travis's side where he was almost like destroy man you know when you first start the game he the first thing he says is wrong answer he just slices the guy open and he's like fuckhead and he's telling death metal how great it is to to do this you know all people like us we love this he he tells that to dr peace as well that he feels euphoric in this he he gets excited oh he loves the bloodshed and then once he finally faces someone that's very conniving and and thirsty and just very violent he confronts that and destroys him so not only is uh, Trev's going through all these other psychotic people, but he's also kind of facing little bits of him in all of these people. And I think that's another angle that some people might not even realize. I don't, I, because I don't really hear a lot of people, I don't even think Genry addressed this as much as these bosses really show a side of Travis that he's facing off. So in a way, like, I guess the closest thing that Genry brings up is that is that 251 does a lot of killing the past kind of themes in his games. And to a degree, I guess this is Travis going and killing the past with each boss fight. He's kind of going after his old self or a self of him that he's, he's uh, battling. Uh, it, and it, it just shows where he is mentally each fight he's a different person every time that you see him face off he's kind of, he's a little bit different each time uh so after destroy man he faces off with holly summers now this one i didn't really think much about this fight when i first played it i didn't really didn't really i also didn't really care but this time around i really really liked it a lot uh and it kind of drives the point home for travis that that it's that there's this hopeless sense of of innocence with all of this that you know someone does have to die and some people might just be waiting for that seeking for that uh or or willing it uh you know he mentioned he 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 kind of calls all out for for trying to find meaning in death and kind of looks down on it but by the end, he starts to understand really what she means by, and, and why she's looking, looking for a meaning of it is because there is this fear that you might you may still have that's not really that you're that you're not acknowledging, uh, and this is and this really I feel represents the side of Travis that he doesn't that he didn't think about until this fight because he he belittles. Uh, or mocks Holly Summers for Troy and find meaning in it. And then at the end, when by the time he understands it, she already kills herself. She puts the grenade in her mouth and blows up, and he, he immediately regrets what he said to her because he understands that, you know, there there's stuff that people just think about stuff to, to draw them away from the reality of it all. Like, that she was thinking about the meaning of death, they get away from who she was and all that kind of stuff, and to really uh, explore that because she was afraid that death was coming to her by some to some degree. And this was something that Travis had, does have to uh, confront. So Holly Summers is just that pivotal moment where it just hits you that uh, shit can happen. Uh... And, you know, maybe there is a meaning. Now the other fight. Let's Shake. Let's Shake is a, is a meaningless fight. Uh, this one has no no substance. And I think that is best exemplified or, or represented by the designs of Let's Shake and uh, of, uh, of those two, of those two uh, boss characters. 
the fact that it's just a big brain in a rocket and you have this one rocker guy that's just telling him to, to start the thruster engines and all this shit. Like, it's this big nonsensical machine and the camera takes so it takes so long just to start start the whole thing up like it's this big thing and it's like all right starting this energy and you're going through all this stuff like even the game knows this bullshit and it put it it builds it up for no reason even though the game you and the game both know that this is a nonsensical uh, boss fight and it gets interrupted by henry henry sir douche uh when that guy comes in he just robs it from travis and this has literally no meaning. The only thing that it serves is to is to move the story forward. It's to kind of get, get the characters moving in, in a certain place and to introduce a character that will come later on in this video. Uh, so there's really nothing much to say other than I did like... I love, I love stories that give you this meaningless buildup for something just to be destroyed anyway. I just love that it did that and i just love the expectation that it kind of destroys and takes away from you uh from that so then after let's shake you have to fight face off with the rank four assassin uh a guy with a long name the magician dude it's like uh vladimir Volarsky malarkey I don't, I don't i don't know he has a long name it has a cool intro though but i can't remember the name this one I think is just is just a um a nonsensical fight that doesn't really have any deeper meaning. I I think after Let's Shake, this one was just kind of like the comic relief, just kind of to get you back into the groove of things. It doesn't drop anything heavy on you, uh, other than it it uh, confirms that uh, Travis's parents are dead. It just shows that this guy is just willing to do all his killing with all this stuff. It just it just shows just that it's really nothing much to it for this fight but i do love the game i do love the boss fight though it's pretty cool every time i love that the camera turned upside down i loved all that kind of stuff it was really fun to uh to play it so i gotta give credit to uh Studio 51 for that one uh the other character you face off after the magician is the rank three is speed buster this one i i kind of loved i hate it i hate it at first because i didn't understand the boss fight but uh i loved it i love that this one you see your master your mentor that you see at the gym and he's there facing off with her and she, and uh she heartlessly kills him and I, he comes back he does come back as a spirit don't worry but i love that the char the boss that kills her is this, this uh, ups angry widow that is cursing the woes of men and how ignorant they are and stupid and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, she just represents death, just straight up death. And uh, there's really nothing deep than that other than that. Like, this is death. This is death. Uh, this is just Travis kind of coming to terms that death is around the corner. Death can happen to anyone. The fact that that fight starts off with killing someone that he looked up to, someone that he, that he was training under, that you know he was he he fell victim to this lady. That death is always around the corner. Anyone can get you, and that's what it kind of represents. And when he kills him, kills her. You know, the last extreme that they have is that uh, she tells him that, you know, his master was a really good person, a good man, and all this kind of stuff. And he's like, yeah, you bet, and this and that. And then he kills her, then and there. It's nothing personable or romantic or, or emotional, but it's just this acceptance of death. death can come for you, and you just have to accept that. So I do like, and it is is visually stunning in that regard. So I do like that uh, that that Speedbuster represents that part of it. Then we get to Bad Girl. Bad Girl, I had a hard time beating her the first time I was first playing No More Heroes. She was very fast and she was very hard to kind of pin down. But this time around, it wasn't that bad. Baby, I got it. But anyways... 
uh, I liked what Bad Girl represented to the character. The fact that Bad Girl literally calls out that Travis is looking down at her like, oh, you know, it's not, this is not good for you or whatever. She just tells him straight up like, this is the grind. This is the job. Who are you to tell me? what this is you do the same shit like he she just calls it calls him out immediately and to an extent it calls out the gamer the gamer the player has gone through all this stuff and they're gonna be thinking that when they see her like who are you you went through all of this you've killed so many people in this game and you're gonna judge bad girl for having the same attitude towards towards these other npcs like you know who are you to, to feel that so I do like that they have a character that kind of calls out the double standard or the hypocrisy that people have when they are put in this situation that, oh, well, I'm killing, but I'm killing for, for, my, for the right reasons. No, you're not. You're, you're going through this. You're doing all this stuff, and you're, and you're enjoying it. Like, Travis has enjoyed it every step of the way, and so has you, the player, and for you to kind of look down on bad girl for for just feeling the same way is is, is the double standard the game calls you out for and it's, and, and it's unapologetic for it uh and i do love that she just tells it bluntly because if you because there's another thing that people don't think about you you're told that well working at working at any job is a grind man but then every every media every story that shows a job of that involves killing someone or whatever they never show the angle of it that to them it's a grind it, they're doing the same shit almost they're doing the same thing they go to work their job tells them they have to kill this person that that day or whatever and it becomes a grind for them so bad so imagine you being bad girl or Travis doing this day in day out getting money going off killing people you know it's, it's not going to be as as like out there as it is on you know once you do it enough times and bad girl also shows the very dark side of that kind of work and i really really appreciate how just unapologetic it is the visuals of her being in this innocent dress that looks like it's for like a child and she has this very dark attitude towards it she looks like that she's seen a lot of shit and she's dead inside if you fast forward to travis strikes again bad man says the same thing when when he rev little spoilers for that game too but when bad man revives bad girl he sees that she's not the same girl that he knew when when she was young she she's different she's she has, she's hardened, she's changed, she's not the same person. And Badman's visual novel story in Travis Strikes Again, uh, it, you know, Badman sees all the shit that she's been, she's been put through, and she's not this, and she can't be the same person. So, Bad Girl being this very dark uh, character in the game is very mean, is very uh unapologetic to the player that it's meant to make you feel uncomfortable and uneasy you're not supposed to feel comfortable that this character is so dark and twisted uh so i really really do appreciate a lot of what they showed uh with that character it's very uh powerful for what is being displayed so i really do like uh what they did with bad girl and kind of the, this angle that Travis has to has to face that Travis does have to face that this that what he's doing might become a grind for him this could be him he's he, he like he's potentially looking in a mirror of what he could become if he continues down this path as i said before and multiple times in this video a lot of these boss fights that you go you come across in no more heroes is yourself you're going through all these personalities and changes that 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 you would go through all these little pieces of travis are all displayed in these boss fights and travis is merciless is killing each and each one of them so after he kills bad bad girl he kind of is exhausted from that fight he realizes how devoted how uh desperate she was to win uh and just how dead she was like like nothing mattered to her she was she was dead and she didn't care she only cared that that she would win uh and she was very desperate for it so travis tells her at the very end 
that she wins. And that just shows just how powerful that, that moment is. So now we move on to rank one. Uh, the final fight, I can't remember his name. It starts with a Z, has purple hair, Castleman. This one was a fun, a fun uh, little part of the story. And here is where the game really changes. So it plays off the gimmick, the trope, that the final man of this long journey is your, is your father. And you're just like, what? And then that guy who claimed to be your father and the rank one assassin gets brutally murdered by a random woman by the name of Jean. If you didn't realize, Travis's cat's name is also Jean. And remember what I said before during the death metal part of this video. I want you to keep it keep track of something with this, right? So everyone so everyone thinks that the whole motivation for Travis was to be with Sylvia Crystal. That oh him doing all this stuff and feeling betrayed is bullshit because he because he uh was doing this to be with crystal wrong actually he like you'd never noticed it and the character to a point has for probably has forgotten what set him on this path in the first place it's very specific that one of the scenes they play in the intro is him at a bar and it's a muted scene. You don't hear what's being told. But you're being told ahead of time that, well, we're going to take over the world. We're going to fuck shit up. And this and that is exciting, like, intense beat. The game intentionally gives you a fake story. Not necessarily that it doesn't exist or it didn't happen. But it gives you a fake expectation. It gives you a red herring of sorts. That you're going through this thinking... You're just going to be rank one, and then that's going to be it. This is what where, when I was playing this in 2016, where I fell in love with the game, just on the surface level of that, of that twist, of it being something completely different. But playing it this time around really, really got me excited, because he never was involved with the UAA and doing all this stuff to be with Crystal in the first place. He was doing this to get revenge, and then by the time that he realized when he killed Death Metal that he came back out of it, he got mad because he he probably was gonna back out after killing Death Metal, probably, maybe. But he ends up continuing down the journey so that he could so he could send for uh, Sylvia. So it's very clever that this that this game gave you this Bullshit story to, to go all the way through. And at the end, they even called out with Gene telling him, Think about it, Travis. Why would he be your father? And he starts, and the, his memories start flooding back to him, where he starts realizing that there's this one memory he has of this one girl that killed both his mom and dad and he doesn't know who who she was and this that and then it cuts back to the bar where he says to to Sylvia at that time that that bitch took everything from me uh everything I ever cared about whatever all this stuff that that went into the story and it's also can be assumed that he was probably drunk when he was telling her all this stuff so he probably didn't remember the real reason why he was going down this revenge path while Sylvia Crystal literally was the only one in the know and she never told him because for whatever reason. So I really enjoyed that this game gave such a bullshit path for the gamer to believe was the story just to flip it on its head and say this was the real story and the best part is that this did not come out of left field. It was always in the story. It was just in the very, 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 very distant background. You had that, as I said in the beginning, that he was never motivated to kill Death Metal to be with Sylvia. He only got that motivation after, after the fact. You have a cat named Jean. 
Henry shows up. You have all these things. These are very, 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 very subtle hints that are not in the foreground. A lot of stories try to, if they try to throw this twist at the end, they try to give you more clues as to the story coming up. But No More Heroes keeps it so minimal that you wouldn't even think about it. And this can, this is, it's so minimal that it's literally bordering the line that maybe I'm overthinking these little things in the game. But there's so much that Suda51 throws in that I just, I kind of don't find it a, a, a coincidence that when you first go through Death Metal, he never once mentions that he wants to sleep with Sylvia Crystal or that he wants to be with her or any sexual attraction to her up until she starts teasing him about, oh, well, you can, I only go with number ones. And that's when it, it clicked. So that's why I think it's not really much of a stretch to feel that he was involved in this unknowingly the real reason why he did it in the first place. He probably did it for some other reason that was in line with it, but he never really found out the true reason until the end. That's why at the very end he mentions that he did all this to get to her, and that's why Sylvia lined up all these battles to harden him up to do this. And that's really a compelling arc and journey! Like... And it's not even a coincidence. I don't even think it's a coincidence that that what I said before. Now that I'm thinking, I'm thinking that's on the fly as well. Now that I'm thinking about how I went through all of this stuff to go through these these fights, saying that these fights are part of Travis's character personality, and each one of these characters represents a a possibility that this line of work can lead to. You know, Sylvia could be intentionally have pitted him against these people so that he understands that where this journey can go it's not the cliche where someone comes up to you and says revenge is gonna lead in a very bad place revenge is bad it's not a very on the nose lame message that a lot of stories go for this is a very like intricate story that it does have revenge but it shows the that these con that the consequences that could come from it that you could be just like these other people that could be empty or dead inside or or whatever. You know, all the stuff that he's doing could lead him to that, to that path. And he continued, ne nevertheless, to the very end, where he's rewarded to finally face off with Jean, his half... I think it was his half-sister or, or sister. It's one of those two. But I know she's obviously related to him because she wanted to get revenge. Now, of course, the kid to me, I love that it it did this fourth wall break where they call out on Duke Nukem Forever and, and they're like saying like, oh, my backstory is so dark and, and uh, fucked up that it would only jack up the age rating and you don't want this game to be delayed again and become a No More Heroes Forever, uh, which I really, you know, at the time it was really funny because you never know that that game was going to come out. But, uh... I mean, now it's kind of like a funny joke, regardless. I mean, it's a dated joke, sure, but it's a funny joke still. That's probably the only joke that you could argue that it aged, but it's still a very solid joke all the same. So I really, really like, uh, I like that as a, as a uh, when I was playing that the first time, was that little fourth wall break of mentioning another game, having Travis literally fast forward the uh, dialogue, which you can now, like, you know what's insane? 2006, the burdening era of YouTube. Someone like record, like uploaded that whole segment and slowed the footage down, and that it, it blows my mind because usually, like, you'd think that would be some kind of effect to speed up the dialogue that might just be nonsense or whatever. But they actually had the person say all these words normally and then edited it in the fast forward thing. Because someone slowed it down and it was like a normal like delivery, which is hilarious to me. I, lo I, I love little things like that. So you can find what actually happened on YouTube if you missed out on some of the stuff. Which, you know, when I was playing it this time around, I was still able to discern what she was saying. Uh, even with that filter going on. You do you could pick up on some of the stuff, which is funny, but... Uh, you can get it all in normal speed on YouTube now. And you can probably get it in better, better quality, too, on top of that. Uh, so you beat her. And this is the other part I loved was that at the very end, there's this bonding that you see between Jean and Travis. Like, between these two characters, there wasn't any... I don't think there was anything malicious. There was no malicious hate 
that be going on between Travis and uh, and Jean, uh, because they both understood where they were coming from. Like Travis knew why she did what she did, and Jean understands why he wants to kill her. Like you know, a lot of revenge revenge stories try to pit uh, both sides as or either one side being heroic or the other or saying that well this guy's going after revenge but the wrong way or or whatever but this it's like no these two characters know what they're doing they they know they know that this is fucked up they know the consequences and they accept that like that's how it starts off i mean he even says that vengeance begets vengeance and i oh you know all this kind of stuff and she's like yeah then come get get some whatever and at the very end, as she's, like, ready to die, she's like, I'm ready for it to be over. She can't live on like this. Like, she she knew that she couldn't continue. And the other thing that I think is really meaningful, I don't think, that I didn't really think of, is that Jean shoves her hand into Travis's chest, and Shinobu cuts off her hand. At, I don't know, was it, maybe it was before. Ah, fuck it. I'm not gonna mention it then, never mind. Uh, I was just thinking about that because I don't know if like you know you know she she stabs her fist right into Travis's chest and then like Shinobu cuts off this part and then part of her hand is stuck in Travis's head um head fit uh chest but I it could either be that or that cuts off just before the contact I don't know uh, whatever so that's why I didn't want to mention it guys anyways so she so they. Even Travis is like this. This hurts me too, Jean, and he kill and he kills her uh, to give her some sort of mercy uh, from the terrible life she had. She was abused. She was uh, forced into prostitution to make ends meet. Like she did not have a good life, and uh, she was ready to end it. And that's why she was going down this path to begin with. She knew where the end was gonna be. And so did Travis going through all these, all these death, these, all these fights. He, he saw what this turns people uh, into. So a lot of that, that Suda 51 threw in, you know, didn't really hit me the first time around. I just saw them as cool little boss characters with cool little stories and stuff. But this, but when I was going against it, going against it, playing it again this time around, I really grew to appreciate what the game was doing like what was being said what the meaning of all this that was that was going on so i really did enjoy a lot of what suda 51 did with no more heroes so we must ha we must continue on to the secret boss character henry henry i feel is kind of a way to brighten the mood after after uh the whole thing with gene <clears throat> It starts off with this character coming in, busting into Travis's bathroom, ready to kill him. Henry slices him up, and you have to fight Henry. During this fight, you you find out that Henry is actually your twin brother. This was a very goofy twist that comes out of left field. This is probably the only thing that you that people could argue is pretty poorly written or last minute, whatever. But the thing that, that the reason why No More Heroes I I feel gets away with it is that it had this kind of tone in, in going on anyway. So for them to just to throw in that oh yeah he's his twin brother is just kind of hilarious. I mean they even bring up story structure like oh I'm just the foil you have to figure out how to, how this ends because you're the main character. So like you know the ending really ends on a huge fourth wall break because. It's kind of Suda 51's way of ending that, like, you know, it's just a video game. It just kind of, it it pulls you, it, it kind of grounds you as the player to realize that what you just watch is a good story and has all this stuff going on, but to never be mistaken that you're playing a video game. And the story can be anything. And I love that it's embodied in the Henry fight. Henry has all these eccentric moves that he does and sure he's supposed to be a semi-mimic of Travis and this ideology of according to Genry I'm I'm citing Genry's video again I'll probably put the link to that video in the description uh that Genry represent 
Henry, <laughs> Henry represents this. Uh, Henry represents uh, this Western culture, this, this, uh, these, these knights kind of stuff, these knight ideology and all that, while Travis represents more of a Japan Eastern ideology. And a big East versus West kind of uh, setup. So I do like a lot of that. And it ends with a uh, too bad there won't be a No More Heroes 2. I will probably talk about No More Heroes 2 when I beat it, to be honest. I do want to talk about it now, especially that I started that game. And I have a lot to say about that game just already and not halfway through. <laughs> but, uh... I love No More Heroes 1. It is really one of my favorite games on during that time period. Uh, I'm so glad it's on the Switch. I can always go back to it now. I really, really, really loved uh, No More Heroes. It, really, it was really one of my favorite games that I played. And I took a chance on it, even though it was... I mean, I took a chance on it for my birthday. And I loved playing it. All the way through, I was enjoying the everything about it, and going through it again just gave me more love to that game. Like I loved it way more than I did the first time. And in, you know, when a game does that, you know it's a great game. It's really one of my favorite Suda Fifty One games. And that and that was my first experience with Suda Fifty One. I did play Killer Seven uh, when that came out, and the controls were too out there for me. Uh, so. It didn't that that game did not last long, but uh, No More Heroes was the true first No More uh, Studio Fifty One game I really played, and uh, I'm really excited to play No More Heroes Three. I am really excited for that, and the fact that Studio Fifty One is directing that just means that it might be something good because Travis Tricks again was also directed by Studio Fifty One, and I loved that story, so. That is it for this video. Again, thank you guys for watching. Thank you guys for all the support, be it however you you watch my videos or support me however you guys choose. Thank you guys all the same. Hope you guys have a good week. Hope you enjoyed the video. Hope to see you in the next one. See you when I see ya. Bye-bye.